Interest in Child Development. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dr. Suzanne Lemenestrel, and I'm the Director of Science Affairs with the Society for Research and Child Development in Washington, D.C. SFCD, which was founded in 1933, is a scientific society with over 3,700 members. Our mission is to advance the developmental sciences and promote the use of developmental research to improve human lives. I'm so pleased that you could join us for our fourth lecture in the Child Development and Diverse Majority Society Lecture Series. This lecture series grew out of the SRCD Ethnic and Racial Issues Committee, and the series highlights research on children informing the impact of the U.S. transition to a racial, ethnic, majority, minority society for the year 2043. This lecture series is part of SRCD's commitment to anti-racism, equity, and inclusion. SRCD was a leader in implementing a policy requiring authors, for example, in our journals, to provide specific socio-cultural information about the children, families, and communities in their studies. Next up, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Lionel Howard, who is the Interim Academic Dean and Associate Professor of Educational Research in the Graduate School of Education and Human Development at George Washington University. Dr. Howard is a developmental psychologist and is the co-chair, together with Dr. Mariah Contreras, Tufts University of SRCD's Ethnic and Racial Issues Committee. Welcome, Dr. Howard. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Ethnic and Racial Issues Committee, I welcome you to this year's Diverse Majority Lecture Series. Please note that SRCD will be recording this webinar and a copy will be available on srcd.org by the end of the month. An SRCD staff person will be monitoring the chat if there are any technical issues. Also, please submit your questions through the question box in your Zoom control panel. And Dr. Golden, our moderator for today, will share them during the question and answer session if your question has not been addressed. This year's lecture is titled Innovations and in Inquiry, Implications for, pra for Practice and Policy. The invited presenters have been asked to consider how has innovation in theory development, conceptual frameworks, and epistemological orientations informed research design, methodological approaches, and analysis? Specifically, they've been asked to present on innovations within the context of inquiry, practice, and policy, and to reflect on how they have come to such innovations as scholars within the field of developmental psychology. The presentations may also include their perspectives on the implications for how we engage in team science and collaborative inquiry. Our first presenter, Dr. Josefina Banales, is an assistant professor in the Community and Applied Developmental Psychology area at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Her research examines how racially and ethnically minoritized youth develop beliefs, feelings, and actions that challenge racism, i.e. youth critical racial consciousness development. In collaboration with youth, schools, parents, and community organization, she, she co-creates opportunities that facilitates youth's critical consciousness development. Dr. Banals infuses her personal experiences as a Mexican-American woman who was first-generation high school, college, and doctoral student from the Southwest side of Chicago with her community-engaged research with youth of color in schools and community organizations. Our second invited presenter, Dr. Brandon Yo, is an, assistant, is an associate professor of Asian Pacific American Studies in the School of Social Transformation and the School of Social and Family Dynamics at Arizona State University. Drawing on critical race theory, his academic work broadly focuses on unique racialized risk, resiliency and resistance, and their psychological correlates among racially minoritized youth and families, including Asian Americans and multiracials. In collaboration with students and colleagues across disciplines, Dr. Yeo publishes on topics of perceived racism, internalization of the model minority myth, acculturation and enculturation, ethnic and racial identity, ethnic and racial socialization, critical consciousness, and measurement development. His recent work also includes the development of new measures, support for Black Lives Matters, and Asian American racial identity to understand how different minoritized groups engage in cross-racial solidarity work. He similarly teaches courses related, including cultural psychology, race and child development, Bruce Lee, and Asian American psychology. 
Dr. Yo is also particularly active in both community and professional organizations that address Asian American mental health issues and needs. Finally, our moderator for today's lecture is Dr. Alexandria R. Golden, who is Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Memphis. She earned her doctorate in clinical community psychology at the University of South Carolina and completed her postdoctoral fellowship at Cleveland State University and the Center for Urban Education. Dr. Golden's scholarship focuses on the resilience and positive development of racially minoritized youth who experience racism with a focus on Black adolescents. Her work focuses on three interdisciplinary lines of research, including school racial climate, peer racial socialization, and critical consciousness. Dr. Golden is committed to empowering marginalized youth and amplifying their voices and experiences through her translation and community-engaged research and practice. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Banalas. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Dr. Howard. Like um, Dr. Howard mentioned, I'm Josefina Banales, and I am so incredibly excited to be here with you all today to share my work on youth-led anti-racism research in alternative to mainstream developmental science that promotes racial justice for racially and ethnically minoritized youth. I first want to start our time here together with some intentions. The first being, I'm really hoping to provide a space for you all to begin to reflect on a key guiding question. We're going to return to this question a few times during our time together, and it's focus on this question. What would it look like for developmental science to actively challenge white supremacy and adultism? and promote racial justice for racially and ethnically minoritized youth and their families and their communities. In addition to reflecting on this key guiding question, I intend to begin to or further increase your awareness of white supremacy and adultism as foundational to mainstream developmental science. And I aim to provide an alternative, one alternative, to challenge white supremacy and adultism in mainstream developmental science, I present and share some principles of my work of youth-led anti-racism research that really aims to challenge these two systems of oppression in our field. And I'm going to walk you through the ways in which that I have engaged myself, my youth collaborators, my community-based partners aim to um, engage in youth-led anti-racism research. And I'm going to show you some examples from my current work as well as my previous work. And then we're going to conclude with some key takeaways. All right, so back to this question, back to this key guiding question. What would it look like for developmental science to actively challenge white supremacy and adultism? So you might notice, and I'm bolding white supremacy and adultism here because what you might notice is that I'm making some key foundational claims here, right? I am making key claims that white supremacy and adultism are a part of our field, are a part of our science. Of course, I am not the first person to be making these claims, especially not the first person to acknowledge that white supremacy is part and parcel to developmental science, that psychology is rooted in white supremacy. Our own governing psychological association, APA, the American Psychological Association, as well as decades amount of research um, via books, empirical articles, really document the ways in which that psychologists have perpetuated white supremacy in our field. Developmental scientists, primarily cis heterosexual white men have extracted the knowledge, the expertise, the wisdom from racially and ethnically minoritized communities. This is well documented by now. And we know that this has resulted in numerous deleterious consequences that operate on all levels of society. So for example, we know that communities of color, minoritized communities often voice a lack of trust of mainstream institutions, of higher education institutions, of healthcare institutions. 
And another manifestation of this that my work is particularly interested in is that by developmental science extracting knowledge and expertise from racially and ethnically minoritized communities, it omits the voices of the people, omits the voices of racially and ethnically minoritized people from the very work that aims to impact them. Now, in addition to white supremacy being part and parcel to psychology, we also know that adultism is a key foundational component of developmental science. And adultism is the systemic and interpersonal exclusion from youth from making decisions that impact their lives. And we know from folks who are working in community psychology, in our sister fields, our related fields, right? Social work, um, sociology, that when, so adultism is present in our field through the development of psychological theories, of measures, the interpretation of results, the development and implementation of programs that have been developed primarily by white adults. And we think about this as research on youth. And similar to the ways in which white supremacy functions in our field, we know that adultism excludes youth from the opportunity to speak about their own racialized experiences, their own ways that they're navigating the world. It excludes them from being able to make research decisions that result in work that impacts their lives, impacts their parents' lives, their families' lives. And it prevents them from deciding how they actually want to translate, translate research into action. And so the consequences of this is that we end up having theories, measures, and programs that are less culturally relevant, less developmentally appropriate, and less responsive to youth's needs and their experiences. So what do we do, right? So again, I'm beginning to increase your awareness of white supremacy and adultism, or perhaps this is not new information, we're building from your current knowledge, but you probably are here because you wanna know some alternatives, right? So one way that we can challenge white supremacy and adultism in the field is by engaging in youth-led anti-racism research. Or what myself and other scholars, collaborators of mine have called, or we um, deem it as research with youth, as opposed to research on youth. And there are many principles of youth-led anti-racism research, but I'm gonna highlight three key principles today. The first being, that youth-led anti-racism research really centers the voices of racially and ethnically minoritized youth in the research process. It actively collaborates with youth to create programs that are grounded in youth experiences and responses to youth and their community's needs. And it intentionally works with youth to use research to promote racial justice for youth and their communities. And so what we're gonna do now is I'm going to give you some key examples of how this actually looks like in practice. I'm going to map on those three principles of youth-led anti-racism research on two of my research and practice-based studies to give you a sense of what this actually looks like in practice. So we're gonna look in the past, we're gonna look at one of my research practice-based studies in the context of a youth dialogue program around race. And then we're going to look in current times, as well as in the future time, as well as how the principles map onto my current and um, upcoming research. All right. So first principle in action. We're first going to talk about how to center the voices of racially and ethnically minoritized youth in the research process by exploring the ways in which that we developed and validated a measure of youth anti-racism action with and for youth. Now this work was done in collaboration with a team of my youth collaborators, as well as Dr. Adriana Aldana and Dr. Katie Richard Schuster. So I'm gonna give you a sense of the research practice context. So this work happened in the context of a summer youth dialogue program that aims to increase use of discussions of race and racism, as well as collective action in challenging racism. And this summer dialogue program included racially and ethnically diverse youth, so it included youth of color, white youth, 
but the, the majority of youth who participated were youth of color. And it was hosted in a large metropolitan city in the Midwest. It started in 2005 and it's still currently being held. And research was a key component of the dialogue um, program. So youth completed pre and post interviews and surveys that really aimed to get at young people's ethnic racial identity development, their ethnic racial socialization, and their civic engagement. So now I'm gonna give you a sense of how this youth informed, youth led measure was created. So like I mentioned, research was already pretty foundational. You know, the value of research was pretty foundational to the dialogue, but it was really the young people who were in the dialogue that really pushed for the development of this measure. They really questioned us. They questioned the adult facilitators of the program around, well, I'm doing this program all summer. What does it actually do for the outcome you're saying that it should achieve? collective action against racism. They were really pushing around how impactful is this program really to what you're saying it should do. And so it was really young people's voices that motivated the initiation of this development of this measure. And so because of young people's um, motivation to evaluate the program, we formed this youth evaluation team that included three high school students and two university staff that aimed to evaluate the impact of this dialogue on their anti-racism actions. Which led us to the data, right? So like I mentioned, we were already collecting data around the program. And together with the young people, our youth evaluation team, we reviewed interviews, open-ended survey responses around what are some actions that the previous dialogue participants are taking to give us a sense of, are there different types of actions that young people are using to challenge racism in their lives? And we found out there were. So informed by that data analysis with our youth evaluation team, we created a 22 item measure called the Anti-Racism Social Action Scale, 22 items. And that measure was incorporated into the implementation of the dialogue. It was included in those pre and post surveys to actually examine the effects of the dialogue over time. It was embedded in the evaluation. And in future years, we ran psychometrics on the measure, so exploratory factor analyses, confirmatory factor analyses, which resulted in um, confirmation that this is actually a valuable, reliable measure that researchers can use in their work. And so you all might be really eager to see, well, what were some of the items that the young people created in this anti-racism action measure? And so I present three sample items here for you all today. And two key things that I wanna highlight here is that young people were very critical, very intentional about the language we use to create these questions. So in the first sample item here, I challenged or checked a friend who uses a racial slur or makes a racial joke. The young people on our team were very intentional about using the word challenged and check a friend because at first we were saying things like, oh, I approach a friend for saying a racial slur. And they were like, we don't talk like that. Nobody talks like that. They really challenged us to think critically about having language that represented their lives and how they actually talk. So that's a key takeaway I want to emphasize here is that this language was very intentional, used by young people to make it relevant to their lives. I also want to bring your attention up to the binary nature of this measure, right? So it was a zero no and one yes. And you all might be thinking, well, why not a liquor type scale, right? You know, that's something that we often use in our research because it allows for more variability, one through seven, one through six. The young people on our team said that that was too complicated. They said this needs to be easily understood and easily used by young people, yes or no. So they were very intentional too about making it a binary. And so bringing study one together, right, this first example together, principle one, I'm hoping now that you have a better sense of how we mapped this principle on or how this principle was embedded in this first youth-led project. And so first, youth inspired the motivation of the study. Like I mentioned, they really were the ones that voiced interest in evaluating the dialogue. 
Youth contributed to methodological decisions. They expressed knowledge that the interview and survey data could be analyzed. And they also co-led the development of survey item wording like we were just talking about. And youth also contributed to analytical decisions. So they co-led analysis of the interview data and survey data to create that initial anti-racism social action measure. They were involved in the research process. All right, so now I'm taking you to where my work is and where it's going. And we are going to be focusing now on principles two and three in the context of the development of Ruzi Resistencia, the development of a youth-informed pilot program that simulates an anti-racist identity and anti-racism behaviors among Latinx youth. And this work is being done in collaboration with my Latinx Youth Research Fellows collaborators, our community partner Mil Mundos, which is a bilingual Spanish-English bookstore in New York, Doctor with Dr. Debbie Rivers Drake, Dr. Adriana Aldana and Stacey Gravera. So Ruti Resistencia, the key outcomes of this program is, or are, to create a program for Latinx youth to explore their anti-racist identity and to challenge white supremacy using anti-racism actions. We also aim to co-create and implement the program with Latinx youth and Latinx young adults um, who serve them, as well as ground the program in the voices, the dreams, the visions of Latinx youth across the US. And in this work, we have two key forms of youth involvement. We have youth contribution, and we have youth collaboration. And I'm gonna walk you through the differences. Youth contribution. So this is something you all might be familiar with. Perhaps you engage in qualitative research, mixed methods research with um, the, the folks you work with in your work, right? So this involves asking youth for their perspectives. What do they wanna see out of the program? So this involves asking youth participants for their thoughts. And we're gonna do this by conducting focus groups with Latinx youth across the United States and exploring their wants, their desires out of Ruti Resistencia. So for example, we're gonna ask them, what issues related to race, ethnicity, culture, and racism would you like to discuss or learn more with other Latinx youth? So that's our youth, co youth contribution arm of the work. But taking it a step further, we also have a youth collaboration arm of our work where we are going to be collaborating with our youth research fellows, which includes a team of four Latinx youth ages 13 to 17. We just uh, hired our last young person last week. So super excited about this work. Like it is happening now. Who are going to collaborate with us on our entire research project. And y'all can think about these young people are research fellows similar to the work that undergraduate research assistants do, but there are some key important differences. And I'm gonna show you some now and I'm happy to, uh, to explain some more later on in the Q&A. So here I am showing you um, some the, the, the outline of our work together, right? The development of Ruzi Resistencia, the pilot program. I'm showing you the different ways that youth contribution and youth collaboration are going to be centered in our work. And so you have a key on the right-hand side of the screen with blue referring to youth collaboration. This is the work of our youth research fellows. And then in the yellow, you have the work being done by our youth participants through youth contribution. So as you see at the top, our youth research fellows are going to be co-developing focus group questions and protocol. They're going to be co-facilitating focus groups with Latinx youth participants. They're going to be co-analyzing focus group data, co-creating program curriculum, and co-facilitating Ruzi Resistencia. And the youth participants, our Latinx youth participants who will be contributing to the study, will do so by sharing their voices, their perspectives via focus groups, as well as their participation in the program and the types of solutions they come up with to challenge white supremacy in the context of Ruta Resistencia. And so bringing us back to our principles, thinking back to principle two, 
actively collaborates with youth to create programs that are grounded in youth experiences and responses to youth and their community's needs. This is the very essence of this work. This is the thread that runs through every single research and practice-based decision we do. This is the work. And in terms of principle three, it intentionally works with youth to use research to promote racial justice for youth and communities. Like I mentioned, a key outcome of the program is to challenge white supremacy. And we will see what youth decide. So this is not determined yet. A big part of this work, like I mentioned, is a key part of the work is it's youth driven. Youth are going to decide how to use research for action. So it could look like a form of action is healing from racism. It could be that youth want to document their family's immigration stories, our longstanding family history in this land we call the United States. That could be a form of anti-racism action for them. Or maybe young people want to organize against racism in their schools, in their neighborhoods, via more political forms of action. We'll see what young people decide. So bringing this all together, white supremacy and adultism are key cornerstones of mainstream developmental science. And what we have done together today is we've reviewed some principles of an alternative to mainstream developmental science that really aims to challenge white supremacy and adultism in our field. And that is youth-led anti-racism research. We went over these three principles it centers the voices of racially and ethnically minoritized youth in the research project process. It actively collaborates with youth to create programs that are grounded in their experiences and responsive to their needs or communities' needs. And it intentionally works with youth to use research to promote racial justice for youth and their communities. And so finally, I wanna lead us back to our key guiding question. This is the question that we began the presentation with. I'm hoping you all now have some potential answers to this question. Maybe it's some of the principles I mentioned, or maybe you have some different answers, and I'm really eager to learn more about them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Banyale, for your incredible work and direction, ampl amplifying the voices of racially minoritized and particularly Latinx um, youth through participatory research. We are definitely looking forward to learning more from you during the Q&A session. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and transition to our second speaker, Dr. Yu, who will talk with us about utilizing critical race theory as a framework for grounding our work with Asian American youth. Good afternoon, everyone. Do you see my slides? By let's see. Can everyone see my slides? We're seeing the your slides. Your presenter slides. You need to switch them to the other one, just the PowerPoint. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Wait. Let's see. Try again. How's that? How's that? Can you see my slides? Perfect. Okay. I'm hoping you can. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank again the SRCD and the Ethnic Racial Identity Committee, Drs. Lionel Howard and Mariah Contreras in particular, for this invitation and creating space for us to share our work focused on minoritized youth and families. I also would like to begin by sharing my positionality and identities that I believe are very important that shapes my research, how I conduct my quantitative research and my practices as a scholar. I'm a 1.5 generation Korean American, Asian American, cisgender, straight and able-bodied. And I recognize here that there are privileges in these identities that would no doubt shade how I've discussed CRT and its implications to my research. Today, I'll be discussing how I apply critical race theory with a particular emphasis on one of its branches, Asian crit, to understand the experience of racism and racial identity of Asian Americans, particularly as a quantitative scholar. Namely, 
I hope to address what are the unique experiences of racism and racial identity of Asian Americans? Why did I choose to use CRT in my work? What is and is not CRT? How is CRT applied to my research? As one of the fastest growing racial groups in the US, there are more than 22 million Asian Americans, about 6% of the US total population, with diverse cultural language, SES, and stories of immigration. Yet, there has been a yet while there has been a significant growth in the past 20 years for the development of broader psychological literature focused on Asian American youth and families, little of our shared and diverse experience with race, racism, and particularly racial identity are studied. There's a limited understanding of Asian American racial identity to mean only a cultural or national identity, forever navigating between the elusive boundaries of what it means to be Asian and American. It's falsely believed to be primarily re reserved for US born and East Asians like Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, not considering what histor historian Erica Lee defines as the 21st century Asian Americans who share a common racialized history of struggles in the agency, but also are transnational immigrants and global Americans who are diverse in age, ethnicities, immigration history, class, gender, and sexuality. Last week, an 18-year-old Asian American woman and an Indiana University student was stabbed multiple times on the bus because she was believed to be Chinese and quote unquote, it would be one less person to blow up our country. Our community and my students once again find ourselves feeling angry, sad, and afraid for ourselves and our family. This of course is not an isolated incident of hate, but a long-standing American history of racism and violence against Asian Americans. White supremacy and anti-Asian violence has, sharp, has sharply arisen across the United States and globally since outbreak of the COVID-19 two years ago and continuing on the rise. Tragic stories uh, about the direct experiences of hate incidents reported to the Stop AAPI Hate National Reporting Center show that Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander individuals and communities are experiencing a greater deal of anti-Asian racism and violence with an underestimate of 11,500 hate incidents reported from March 19, 2020 to March 31st, 2022. Of notable interest, AAPI women were twice more twice more likely than men to report hate incidents, non-binary and sexual minorities were more likely to experience discrimination because of their multiple identities and no state or ethnic density of API were immune to the violence. This trend increased experience of racism related to COVID-19 by Asian Americans across studies. Still again, racism experienced by Asian Americans are minimized, ignored, or myop myopically discussed within the context of the race of the perpetrator and whether the intent of the hate crime was racially motivated. This discrepancy in understanding the experience and impact of racism in part can be understood by how we understand and what is racism in the first place. Racism is too often understood as an individual and intentional acts of meanness. The ideas of individual prejudice, discrimination, and the actions that follow because one feeling superior based on their race. However, we see through history and contemporary experiences that racism is something much more. It is systemic. In particular, it is a system of dominance of, it is a system, Rather, history and current experience of racism describes a more systemic and pervasiveness of an ideological value to justify a white dominance, power, and privilege that manifests itself through our interpersonal, cultural, and institutional practices. What this means is that the experience and impact of racism is not similarly experienced across racial minoritized groups, but rather very different to be pitted and justified, pitted against one another and justifying and rationalizing white dominance, power, and privilege. For Asian Americans, we've been constructed as the Oriental world before this country was founded, quote unquote, and Filipinos first arriving on the shores of Morro Bay, California in October, 1587. Stereotypes both past and present have been used to rationalize violence and exclusionary practices, often pitting our group against other racial minority groups to justify racism. 
Equally important to the racial identity of Asian Americans are the narratives and the stories of resiliency and resistance. In between each of these moments were also Asian Americans who persistently fought against white supremacy and often along with other minoritized groups. Wong Art Kim, Fred Corey Masu, Larry Itilong, Grace Lee Boggs, Yuri Kochiyama, Emma G, and Yuri, and Yuri Ichioka, who coined the term Asian American, to name a few. And as we continue to witness Asian Americans today engaged in cross racial solidarity work, recognizing that white supremacy and oppression ties us all. So the need for cross racial solidarity and intersectionality are required to achieve true equity that lifts us all. So, why did I choose CRT for my work? Over time as a developmental scientist and faculty, particularly in Asian Pacific American studies, I found that our current lived experience of race and racism are inextricably intertwined with our history and absolutely necessary to include in our research, emphasizing interdisciplinary scholarship. I also found the principles of positivism and objectivity in my work and relevant literature limiting when examining race and racism, creating blind spots in my own work and relevant literature such as not actively reflecting on my own positionality that informs and bias my research methods, analyses, interpretations, or a broader literature that assumes racial discrimination or racial identity, for instance, can be compared across racial groups simply because the measures numerically seems valid across groups. It took me a while to unlearn that there is one golden standard of how research should be done. You need to include value and reward more than one way of knowing and studying it. Especially with one who values quantitative work, I found the need to challenge positive assumptions of objectivity where researchers and the research community are independent of one another. For, the re for these reasons and more, I began to incorporate CRT and particularly the derivative Asian crit theory to provide a richer understanding of how Asian Americans have been minoritized as the Oriental, both in the past and present, to justify racism and imperialism. These perspectives offer Asian American psychology a new vantage point in how Asian Americans endure and resist nativism and racism, which raises new questions. How does study of acculturation, ethnic racial identity, discrimination, and socialization account for the unique, racial re, the unique racial formation, stratification, and history of Asians in America? What are the psychological impacts and different ways in which Asian Americans challenge the perpetual foreign, modern minority, and sexual deviant stereotypes? How do research theory and methods account for the diversity of the 21st century Asian Americans who are trans, transnational immigrants and global Americans? In this era of globalization, how do American racist ideologies manifest in a transnational context? How is anti-Blackness within Asian American and Asians abroad influenced by histories of US imperialism? How does the Asian American psychology address not only the agency and protests of Asian Americans, but also how they may be complicit in supporting racism and imperialism, like internalizing modern minority myth, endorsing anti-Blackness and colorism? I'd like to discuss first what is, is and is not CRT. CRT has garnered a lot of news attention the past few years. It particularly started to take shape in controversy in 2020, following a month of calls for racial equality and anti-racism efforts following the murder of George Floyd by the Minnesota police and the rise of anti-Asian hate drawing attention to the long-standing long -standing systemic and institutional racism and violence towards racial minorities in the US. For conservatives and anti-racist supporters, any efforts in teaching about the experiences of racial minority communities or address systemic racism and racial disparities in our school and workplace became synonymous with CRT and the dangers of teaching CRT and further villainized as un-American, divisive, and even racist. Subsequently, according to the analysis by Education Week, 42 states have already introduced bills or taken other steps that will restrict teaching critical race theory or limit how teachers can discuss racism and sexism since January 2021. 18 of these states have imposed these bans and restrictions either through legislation or other avenues. Many of these shared bills often shared languages, restricted by school employees and teaching lessons about these characteristics that are not CRT principles or tenets. Again, the problem here is that none of these are actual principles or tenets of CRT, nor is CRT actively taught in our K through 12 school system where a bill would be needed to restrict it. 
The anti-CRT effort with a conflict campaign described by Pollock and colleagues seems to be no more than another means or strategy in maintaining the racial status quo in our institutions and our educational experiences. Rather, CRT or critical race theory emphasizes Rather, CRT was created actually in the early 1980s by legal scholars, including Derrick Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, Richard Dagado, and Alan Freeman, to name a few, to critique how systemic racism continually impacted our legal system, particularly post-civil rights movement when racism were assumedly no longer relevant. Equally important was the idea and need to address equity and agency. Ultimately, the end goal focused on structural change and social justice in the field. CRT has now been expanded across disciplines, including history, women's studies, education, psychology, sociology, to name a few. The CRT are held by a group of tenets, not all of those here, but often sort of cited, that describes how racism can operate within a particular field, and equally important, how racism or systemic racism can be dismantled. It particularly sort of emphasizes that racism, again, is ordinary, and every day because it is systemic, that social it is a social constructed, and white race white systemic racism are held by the differential racialization of minoritized groups, that it is intersectional, and that the importance of intersectionality and anti essentialism anti essentialism and counter storing are necessary to center and challenge racism. Because CRT emphasizes that minority groups are differentially racialized and maintain racism beyond the black-white binary, there are now different branches of CRT, including Lat crit, tribal crit, multi-crit, and Asian crit. Asian CRT or Asian crit, developed by Sam Muses and John Iftikar, is not a replacement of CRT and its tenets, rather it foregrounds the importance of the CRT tenets on the unique racial history, stratification, and formation of Asians in the United States. In particular, it offers an analytical lens for Asian American psychology to understand and critique how Asian Americans struggle with or complicit in and contest racism based on their distinct racialization relative to other racial groups. It also challenges mainstream psychological theories, policies, and recommendations for practice that emphasize colorblind or race neutral viewpoints as these perspectives inevitably benefit whiteness and render invisible the material consequence of racism for people of color, including Asian Americans. Asian Crit holds seven tenets that form the core of his analytical lens. The first four tenets, Asianization, transnational context, reconstructivist history, and strategic anti essentialism build on the original CRT tenets by adding more details of Asian America's unique racial realities and history. Whereas the last three tenets, intersectionality, story theory and praxis, and commitment to social justice, are reiterations of the original CRT tenets that are central in examining Asian American experiences. Asianization again refers to the refers to how racism is supported by the unique racial formation of Asians in the United States as the Oriental or an alien body and threat to the American national family. Transnational context underscores the global impact of imperialism, colonialism, and neoliberalism on Asian American identity and experience with racism. Constructivist and reconstructivist history foregrounds Asian American history contextualized present day experience of race and racism for Asian Americans in a long standing struggle for self determination. Although Asian ethnic groups share experiences of racial oppression, strategic anti essentialism articulates how Asian Americans are not a monolithic group and that, and that they enact agency by contesting stereotypes that essentialize experience and identities. Intersectionality draws attention to how racism is interlocked with other systems of oppressions and power, including class sexism, classism, heterosexism, and ableism, to better understand how the positionalities of Asian Americans differ based on their statuses in these systems. Story, theory, and praxis advocate the center, the voices, and lived experience of Asian Americans, as well as their unique racial struggles and agency. Finally, commitment to social justice highlights how Asian Americans are active Asians who create their own narratives and direct the course of their present and future lives. How is, C how is CRT applied to my research? Even before I heard of CRT or Asian Crit five years ago, I valued many of these tenets and indirectly integrated them into my studies on how I formulate my research questions, data gathered and interpreted, think about community implications, and try to center the voices and history of Asian American family and youth. 
CRT and its tenets, however, allowed me to further push my thinking in conducting research that interrogates the role of racism, not only in the study of the content, but also the process of the research. Also, I'm more active in thinking about who are the benefactors and stakeholders of my research and thinking about how my research directly benefits the community I am working with. As a quantitative scholar, I have also appreciated the writings and suggestions of QuantCrit that incorporates CRT and, and offers critical guidance on how to work with quantitative data. One of the more highly cited papers on the topic by David Gilborn and colleagues in 2018 offers five main principles of QuantCrit, including the centrality of racism, numbers are not neutral, categories are neither natural nor given, voice and insight, data cannot speak for itself, as data cannot speak for itself, and social justice equity orientation. Another helpful paper by Wendy Castillo and David Gilborn last year offers educational researchers more pragmatic suggestions in how to integrate these principles into your research, which I'll highlight here within the context of my area of my work. Given the centrality of racism when examining race and racial difference in our studies, authors suggest including a more asset-based and deficit-based perspective and a positionized statement in all of our quantitative studies as data analyses and presentation of the research cannot be separated from the researcher and their life and concerns. This seems particularly important when researchers' background are incongruent with the community they are studying. For instance, what does it mean when white researchers are studying the racialized experience of Asian American or black kids? or a researcher who is cisgender straight studying experiences of queer youth and families. Second, as numbers are not neutral and statistical significance does not mean practical significance, authors also suggest researchers choose their denominator carefully when examining who is and is not in your sample, measures validated, and comparisons drawn. For instance, Robert Sellers created Nibia, a measure of racial identity for African-Americans, by African-Americans. But I've seen it, this measure being used with Latinx, Asian American, and even with youth, even with white youth and families. While there may be some statistical evidence of validity and reliability with these other groups, what does it mean to study, for instance, white racial identity using a measure developed, again, for and by African Americans? Categories are neither natural nor given. When studying a racial group or comparison of racial groups, we run the risk of presenting a wholly social, so, a wholly social category as if it were natural and fixed difference. Where the lines are drawn and who draws these little lines will exert a huge influence on the patterns that emerge from the data. For instance, when comparing the mental health multiracials and monoracials, who gets to define who is multiracial and who gets to be included? In data sets of Asian Americans, who are Asian Americans that are represented? Who are not when we make these overgeneralized assumptions? As data cannot speak for itself, principles of voice and insight encourages and asks how are the experiential knowledge of the community centered in what to research, how to research it, and who, what to include in the data gathering, rather than the research and often funders of the project making these decisions. Lastly, social justice, equity, and orientation emphasizes who are the benefactors of the research being conducted and how are communities, and how are communities a factor in this process. What are the intentional ways in which our research benefits our community? I think a great example of how this, how the group who started the stop, hashtag stop API hate collected and shared the results and how the power of number 11,500 seemed more effective nationally in highlighting the pervasiveness of racism against Asian Americans, providing not only voice, but more importantly, being able to share the resources, curriculum and training in how Asian Americans may better navigate and contest these experiences. Over the years, my students, colleagues, and I have tried to integrate these tenets and principles of CRT and Quancrit and Asian Crit in particular, reflecting on how they shape my research area, including papers focused on subjective well being, uh, racial and ethnic socialization for Asian Americans, racial and ethnic socialization for multiracials and thinking about how Asian critical race theory in particular can be used to advance a broader Asian American psychology research. While these other papers are largely 
review papers, one particular measurement paper that tries to include these tenets and principles is our new measure of racial identity for Asian American adolescents and young adults. Although there are many ways to define what it means to be Asian American, we were interested in how Asian American racial identity is politicized and grounded in racial ideology, specifically anti-racism and anti-imperialism, as Darren Maeda, an ethics studies professor, describes. We argue that Asian American is a recent social identity constructed in response to the collective struggles against Asian American hegemony among multi-ethnic and transnational Asian peoples, along with other racial minority groups. In our study, we found three components or types or dimensions of Asian American racial identity, including Asian American unity, interracial solidarity, and transnational critical consciousness. Asian American unity is a cultural response to the discourse on who is included in the category Asian American across intersections of gender, skin color, race, ethnicity, class, and other positionalities. Interracial solidarity is a cultural response to the shared experience of discrimination and exploitation among all racial minority groups. Transnational critical consciousness is a cultural response to Asians in the United States and Asians abroad who shared overlapping racialization and discrimination experience due to white supremacy and imperialism. But this, this definition of Asian American racial identity and related ideological values seems to have so far significant psychological implications for Asian American youth in developing critical consciousness, deconstructing racial stereotype and biases, and developing an adaptive framework and skill to cope with and challenge white supremacy through critical reflection and activism, including supporting Black Lives Matter. To highlight how these components and themes play out in practice is a particular program that I've been involved with um, called the Asian Pacific Advocacy Culture and Education Academy. Basically in 1994, um, our community member, our community members and organizations, including the Asian Chamber of Commerce and the Asian Community Steering Committee, basically approached ASU and said, we need a program for our Asian American and Pacific Islander students, high school students in particular, to better understand the rich history of Asian Americans. And so as the community sort of approached our university, it was from the outset, very early on, a collaboration between community members, community organizations, the students who participated in it, as well as many of our ASU faculty, including many that are in Asian Pacific American studies. Interestingly, directly and indirectly, um, the, it was a program particularly to provide cultural awareness and API history and academic support and leadership skills training for Asian, for Arizona high school students. But interestingly, indirectly and directly over the years, these themes of Asian American unity, interracial solidarity, and transnational critical consciousness was salient. It, the themes, the lessons, and the conversations not only cut across the presentations by our faculty and the conversations, but also our community presenters and speakers, as well as the students who also from year to year draw attention to the needs of and lessons of very specific aspects of how they want to understand the Asian American experience. Um, and I and I think I'll stop there for the sake of time and conclude my talk. I did want to thank uh, particularly my colleagues, but also my amazing students, uh, former, gradu former graduates, Dr. Annabelle Atkin, Dr. Brittany Alexander, Sarah Parks, Abigail, as well as Sarah Parks, Abigail Gabriel, Renee Matriano, and Abby Saavedra, who inspire and probably do a lot better work in these areas than, than I do now in, in their own line of research. Um, as a conclusion to my talk, I hope I provided some answers to the questions of the what are, what are the unique experiences of racism, racial identity of Asian Americans, why did I choose to use my CRT in my work, what is and is not CRT, how is C applied to my research, and hopefully you found some of this pre presentation information useful, and thank you for listening, and thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Dr. Yu. Thank you so much for discussing the importance of using CRT to ground our work with Asian American youth. 
and racially minoritized youth in general um, through helping us understand our own blind spots and pushing us to consider the impacts of um, historical oppression and intersectional identities on youth experiences. Both of these presentations have highlighted the importance of acknowledging how white supremacy is embedded in our systems, including developmental science, and impacts our work. Importantly, um, our presenters have shown us new approaches that we can implement in our work to push back against oppressive, oppressive systems. Um, I'm certain, I am very certain, <laughs> that our audience is interested in understanding more about the ins and outs of doing um, and implementing these approaches in their own work. But with that, we are going to move into the question and answer portion of our event. Um, for the audience, please submit your questions to the question answer box for Dr. Banales and Dr. Yu. And as those questions come in, I will just get us started by asking questions that I've prepared. Then we will move on to the questions that the audience has sent in. Okay, so my first question for um, you either of you can start. Um, so both of your work is grounded in, in theories that center the layered and complex experiences of racially minoritized groups, particularly youth, and consider both the historical and contemporary experiences of oppression that shape their realities. For someone who is just beginning this participatory work, where should they begin if they are feeling overwhelmed by the feeling, by feeling the need to get an in-depth understanding of the historical and contemporary challenges experienced by a group so that they can honor the theories and the participants. Anyone can start. Hmm, it's a good question. Such a good question. I think about, you know, who is the person, right? I, I, from like my perspective and like folks, like often if you have like multi-layered, like we all have intersectional identities, right? And I think many of us, like I can speak for myself, have come to this work because of like our own experiences, right? Like with navigating systems that weren't made for us. So I think about that perspective and what it means to, to learn about maybe things about your own people that you didn't realize, right? Because we weren't taught in school. We just, we, you know, we, we've learned this or further have learned this critical race theory perspective, you know, that we're not always taught truth, right? And so I think that can be overwhelming. Um, if you're like a person of color or a woman of color um, doing the work and you're in graduate school and you're just trying to figure out and you're doing a thesis, um, and so what I come back to is always grounding it in home. And again, I'm speaking from the perspective of like, as a person of color, like as a minoritized scholar is like, what brought you here and what do you already know? Because I think oftentimes we're always like looking on the outside for like validation and it can be overwhelming sometimes. It's like, what do you already know? Right. What do you know from your family? What do you, what is your truth? What is your truth? What do you already know? And that's sort of being a shining light. And you can connect with, you know, Dr. Golden at conferences and you can connect with Dr. Yu at conferences, right? And we can further it from there. Um, but what do you already know? Because you probably know a lot more than maybe what you realize. Can you repeat the question one more time? I want to make sure I, I try to answer it. Absolutely. It was layered and long, so I can do that. <laughs> um, so the question is, for someone who is just beginning this participatory work, where should they begin if they're feeling overwhelmed uh, because they feel like they need to get an in-depth understanding of the historical and contemporary challenges experienced by a group to honor the theories and the participants? Yeah, that is that's such a really great question. Um, I think Particularly as a quantitative scholar, many of, I think there is oftentimes this because of this assumptions of positivism and objectivity that the work that we do is separate. The work that we do in the community that we study are separate from our sense of self, 
um, as a researcher, we are this sort of objective beings who are studying a sample and our sense of self does not participate in that sort of process, right? And I think one of the things that, you know, someone who has been trained as a hardcore quant scholar and ideas of objectivity over the years, I find a dissonance in that prax praxis with my own development, understanding of my own racial identity. Growing up, I did not have Asian American history all the way through college. It, it was a lot of graduate school and in my Asian now Pacific American studies program where I'm a faculty, where I've started to really learn the history of my people. And I think in doing so and bring, trying to bring that back into the research, I think if among many, one of the core thing is that self-reflexivity, um, being overwhelmed with new information of, of the history and the contemporary experiences of the populations that we're studying, I think is normative and, and, and that's okay. That's not a stopping point. That's a great starting point. I think when you start to realize um, the nature of how systemic racism plays um, not only in our community, but the ways in which we would produce and do research. The necessity of self-reflexivity, the necessity of one's own positionality and how that hinders or enhances the work that we do is absolutely necessary. And that process should not be easy and the process of struggle and anxiety, I think is good. I think what helps us facilitate that for me and continue pushing at a system that continue pushes back and not wanting to see my sense of self in the research process is at the start, my family, but it extends out my students, my community members who demand it, right? Who, who historically and currently ask for it. And, I, and, and that sort of is encouraging and that is sort of the support in which I sort of take in trying to better deal. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, beautifully said. The next question for you all, what are the benefits and challenges of doing this work? I'll go first on that one. Um, the benefits and the challenge. I think the benefit is, is that for me in terms of using CRT and their um, and its branches is that it just provides a more clear and a clear sort of framework in how I engage the work, which I didn't have the language or the framework to do before. Um, so it validated that. I think the challenge is that with CRT, and why it's been slow to start um, is that it's not a traditional theory as we understand in psychology, right? So usually theories are explaining relationship between the variables um, and CRT doesn't necessarily do that. It sort of more sort of is a lens in how to sort of critique um, and challenge how racism may play out within a study or within a field or within a particular sort of domain. And so that oftentimes in a particular study, CRT, some of the better studies I've seen is how CRT has been accompanied with other relevant theories to talk about a particular study rather than using CRT alone. The additional sort of challenges of beyond sort of trying to apply the CRT to a particular study or a particular area is just where the field is at and how they're sort of receiving it, right? Um, they don't see, I've, you know, especially for some reason um, before COVID, there were much more resistance um, to including history into, into my scholarship or to include um, highlighting um, how racism may play out in our field. And so, and that sort of resistance has been also been then in being slow and being able to get, um, our publications out and being able to sort of continue to do the sort of the research in the area because in many ways the novelty perhaps um, of CRT and, or, and its application is not sort of well understood in the field and so there's more sort of, sort of challenge in 
what is this? And, 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 I, and I'm not sort of understanding why you need so much in, in trying to include the history when talking about racism or racial identity, right? And, and, and there's a lot of pushback to that and trying to understand, okay, what is the boiler point centered sort of constructs in their relationships? And so some of the, those are some of the, the benefits and the challenges that I've seen. For me, I would say the benefit is that I'm doing the work I've always wanted to do. And it's it's taken me time to get here. Like it's definitely been like little pebbles that grow into little rocks and stepping stones. But when I think back into the back in the day, you know, when I was taking psychology of racism with my mentor, my mentor, Dr. Kara Hudson Banks, I imagined, I envisioned, you know, living back in Chicago you know, working with my people, living in the community I was raised in. And I am, I'm back now. I've, I'm fortunate to be back, right? Um, I have earned to be back. And so I'm doing the work that I want to do that is collaborating with teens in my neighborhood and my community, right? We've been to the same schools. We like live on the same block. So I love that. It, I feel very connected. At the same time, what can get complicated is that I'm always connected, right? Um, and navigating, you know, insider, outsider identities with that. So I'm technically an outsider in the sense of now I have a PhD. Like I came back to Chicago with a PhD, right? I didn't leave Chicago with a PhD. Um, but now I have one. What does that mean, right? I'm not a professor here, um, but I'm still me, you know, living in my home community. Um, you know, I'm a caregiver. Right. And so a lot of the times with the young people who I work with, they're full time, you know, they're students, they're in high school. So when they can meet is after hours or on the weekends. And if I'm trying to fight for some work life balance is tough. I can't be at all the team meetings, you know, so all of, you know, the work I was talking about, the youth evaluation team and um, working with our youth research fellows. I'm not at all of those meetings. There's no way I can be. And in fact, it's not best practice that I should be anyway. You know, we have a lot of, um, you know, youth are are leading things on their own. And that's what we want, right? If I'm truly saying co-leadership, I shouldn't be at every meeting. So this is also, you know, this balance between like preserving, you know, myself and the work in that community. I am not separate from community. I am a part of the community. And at the same time, you know, trying to, um, you know, maintain my well-being, knowing that I can't be involved in everything because it's, a very, you know, saying research involved at every process, there's, you know, many of us weren't trained to do this, right, in, in our programs. And so there's a lot of learning along the way. It takes time and messing up and a lot of patience and letting go of control. I think, you know, a lot of us too are like, mm, 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 right? Like, this is how a research study is supposed to go. Yeah, not when you're doing white par. You may have written a grant, and I, I see somebody's question about that. You may have written a grant and said your key aims are this and your outcomes are this. Yeah, we'll see. Because things change, right? I, I had mentioned, you know, an outcome of Ruta Resistencia as youth challenging white supremacy, but I don't know what that's going to look like for them. You know, for some young people, like I mentioned, it's going to be being in the streets and protesting. For other youth, it's not. You know, for other youth, it's just being among other young people like them other Latino youth like them and just existing and just gathering. And that's going to be enough for them. And I, I think that's a valid form of challenging oppression, right? Rest and joy, which may not be consistent with the deliverables of a grant. So there's some tensions there, right? So I would say that's a thing. That's a reality of doing this, this work. And that is a perfect segue into my next question before we um, get into our audience questions. Um, how do you navigate the challenges of the, the field perceptions of your work using these novel models? So challenges meaning publishing, um, how others recognize your work or the, the rigor of your work, um, deliverables in, in your work. So when we went to publish the Youth Anti-Racism Action Scale, so we were, you know, the scale was used internally. It was just in-house for years. It was used pre and post to see if that dialogue was making an impact on activism. The only reason why we 
submitted it, you know, collected more data, did all the psychometrics on it was because, you know, my collaborator, um, Dr. Adrian Aldano, you know, was presenting it at conferences and so many people were interested in it. Researchers were asking like, can we use this? So that was the only reason um, that we validated it. And, you know, in further reflection, we did realize there was a need in the field for this work. But again, that wasn't the initial motivation of that scale. It was really an in-house scale. And when we submitted that initially for publication, it was tough. We got a lot of pushback about the rigor, about the rigor of young people contributing to the research process, to them engaging in data um, analysis, um, a lot of pushback in what is even the conceptualization of youth anti-racism action. We got pushback at all the levels. It was like conceptualization, methodological um, work, as well as interpretation because youth were involved. That was ultimately the essence of it because youth were involved. They're not trained. There were misconceptions with adultism and white supremacy too, right? Who is the holder of knowledge? Because there's, like I mentioned, primarily youth of color. So that was tough. And so that, it took a long time, much longer for that paper to get published because, you know, we were going on the cycle, right? The journal cycle to see, well, who's going to be receptive to this work? So that paper was a long time coming. And thankfully, you know, and we're not the first, again, to do youth-engaged work. So we cited, you know, our community psychologist partners, right? And we've cited critical race theorists to really um, support the work. So we were not alone in that, right? So we ultimately got it pushed through for publication because we were able to cite all those who came before us to really push forward critical youth development um, methods, but it was still hard. And this wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, five years ago. Um, I think I sort of answered that on the last question, but I think what I can sort of briefly add to that is um, I don't want to age myself, but I've been around where, you know, some of my earlier writings um, where you like, you couldn't use even like white racism or you can even say a system with putting the word white in it, right? Even like if you look at Shelley Rell's, there, it says like a majority group, minority group, that even the idea of whiteness could not sort of be talked about. I mean, that was one of the first things that like reviewers or editors have pointed out or changed. And I think there was a lot of resistance to even having sort of a actual meaningful and earnest sort of conversation around this topic. Um, that's obviously changed a lot over the years. And I I feel very fortunate that there are now journals that are receptive to hearing these points, viewpoints, and thinking about um, while not a traditional theory, um, how might this theory still inform this sort of work? You know, even including like positionality statements in all my quantitative work now, you know, there's pushback in terms of why are you putting this in it? And then it raises whole new questions. And then you ended up writing two separate pages on it rather than just taking out that one paragraph, right? And there's always this compromise and where we sort of push back in terms of the necessity for these that sometimes it feels like more work, but also necessary. Um, you know, also part of that is just the journals. I think sometimes we target certain journals um, that are higher impact factors and, 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 and thinking about the publications and, and where they're going and how, you know, the receptivity of these topics, the receptivity of, of um, trying to incorporate this is, I, I will, I'll say this, um, there are fortunately more journals now where we can have that outlet. Whereas before, I felt very limited in the places where, where I could find a home for this, right? I mean, one of the things I tell my students is that at some point when your work is good enough, you'll find a home for it. But I found that process very early on not so when you start using these languages, when you start using these principles, when you start using these sort of methods. Um, but more so now, I think there's change and hopefully there's there will be continual change. Wonderful. We are going to move into some of the audience questions. So the first um, audience question is for Dr. Banyales. 
To what extent are the evaluations of anti-racism programs for youth looking primarily at participants' beliefs and actions around racism? Are we really concerned primarily with challenging participants' attitudes since by virtue of joining the program and being part of a minoritized population, they're probably well aware of the larger societal attitudes and racism? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to really focus on, you know, the motivation and like the, 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 the essence of Rusa Resistencia in particular. I mean, I think there's so many like anti-racism, I mean, so many programs nowadays, especially in the past two years that are framed as anti-racism programs. It's interesting. Like, again, like when we published the youth anti-racism scale, um, you know, we really drew on social work. Um, to help us with this language. And now I, there's like a rise in these programs that are being framed as anti-racism. So it's interesting, this trend. Um, and so I think, you know, again, this anti-racism programs, it, it, I would just have a lot of questions again about like, what's the purpose of the thing, right? So it sounds like you're saying, you know, what is it if it's overly focused on youth attitudes and beliefs? Yeah, I think some are. You know, I think from my perspective of Ruta Resistencia, really, I mean, the program is intended to be a place of like for Latinx young people to be, right? And again, like I mentioned, to challenge white supremacy depends on them. For them, some of them, it's not going to be activism. It's not going to be um, that systems level change. And I think it is true in that white supremacy is structural. We need, absolutely, we need structural change and interpersonal change. You need to change at all the levels, right? In order to get at, to eliminate white supremacy, of course. And I don't think, you know, imposing you, imposing on youth that, you know, enforcing them, that they have to constantly be thinking about what are you doing structurally? What are you doing structurally? I think, again, we're talking about um, young people and agency and you know, maybe at this time they don't want to do that. And I think that's okay. I think that's okay. Because if we're thinking about this as a lifelong process, a lifelong journey, you know, maybe, you know, on folk, we have folks here who are setting adults, the journey continues, critical consciousness development. And so with my um, work with my collaborators with Ruta Resistencia, it's really a place of love, right? A place of processing, a place of learning, a place of connection. And that is challenging white supremacy. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Our next question is for Dr. Yu. Um, the commenter or the person asking the question starts off by saying, thank you for the insightful discussion about CRT and Asian American youth development, Dr. Yu. Can you talk more about the ways in which the three themes, so trans, translation, transnational CC, interracial solidarity, and Asian American unity was integrated in the curriculum and facilitation of the youth program, and perhaps how you attend for it in your research, for example, how you measure or explore these constructs in your work? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the program, the APACE program, um, again, started a while back, and like our actual APACE, um, the Asian American Studies program as well, it was really created out of the community. And, and I think in part, one of the reasons why I've been in Arizona for so long is, is because of how active our, our community um, are. And as a consequence of that, sort of community efforts, it, it was, it's been really interesting. So every year it actually changes um, in terms of what community members, organizations are available. Again, what students, um, you know, are able to attend, but yet every year there are these beyond sort of the academic, you know, teaching about um, academics and teaching about Asian about history, we always seem to have presenters and speakers and students that can again reinforce these ideas of unity, interracial solidarity, and transnational critical conscious. So, if, for example, this last year, um, you know, some of the 
talks that we had like, particularly sort of focus on like different groups experiences like um, South Asian uh, experiences of race, racism in, in history or how when we think about sort of the issues here in the US, how that sort of experiences are tied transnationally. So um, we had actually a um, one of our students who were a, so it's structured where we have a program director, uh, a, a graduate student, program coordinator, um, and then several undergraduates as peer mentors um, who work not only with the students, um, but they go to lunch and, and they really develop those sort of connections um, beyond sort of the outside of the, the, the program intentionally to create space and relationship for them to be able to talk, process, participate. And, and, and when we do that, we just see, again, th those exact themes sort of come up over and over and over again, um, talking about the sexual minority experience, talking about very specific ethnic group experiences, talking about how, for instance, the last, um, this last summer, how when we look at sort of the nursing programs and, and 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 Filipinos in particular, how those issues and oppressions here are tied and directly rele relevant to um, what's happening in the Philippines, right? Um, and I and it's been re in that way, it's sort of very easy and to, and to have a program where even though you kind of let go of control and have these community and students sort of like, okay, what is this program this year gonna look like? And you have them come in and participate, it still become, always seems to become the same thing, these sort of three themes, right? And I, and I, and I think part of that is because we have a long standing history of these themes as I try to sort of illustrate um, in terms of how Asian Americans have understood the idea of Orientalism and how they sort of contested it through the ideas and the importance of when we say we're Asian American, we're not just talking about just us, but intentionally and mindfully thinking about, you know, when I say Asian American, I'm thinking of other ethnic groups, I'm thinking of gender sexual minorities, I'm thinking about all these other aspects. And I think students and community are thinking about that too, right? And so both past and present, we just see these themes coming out over and over and over again. So to implement these programs, um, to implement specific uh, activities, they just seem to keep repeating over and over, which is which is really sort of neat. Um, you know how we sort of see that in in the research process is I think in part to continually understand for me beyond how these themes are related to mental health, but again, um, how might they sort of tap into a broader sense of radical healing? So there's a framework by um, Brianna French, uh, Helen Bill. Um, uh, Crazy Chen, among others, who've sort of created this radical healing framework. And um, and I've been sort of reading more about that and rethinking, for instance, of, of the idea of racial identity within the context of stress and coping model, because I don't think we just cope with these. Um, I think healing beyond coping, it means something else. Radical healing in particular means something else. And her framework has been, their framework has been particularly helpful in trying to understand how racial identity fits into that, right? So again, I think the, the future line for our lab is to study less about how this directly or relates to mental health um, by using coping strategies or how it provides coping strategies, but more within the context of how are these principles or components tied to challenging and finding agency in this sort of system? What does it mean for radical healing to dialectically sort of struggle with this systemic interlocking oppression and the opportunity of hopefully reimagining a new, a new future that is equitable and just, right? Those seems very opposite and overwhelming for many of us. And I think when you start to use their model and thinking about the different components and importance of one's history, the social support, the critical consciousness, and these other parts, then I think how we understand racial identity as beyond coping, but a radical healing can provide more insights. And I think our lab is going in that direction. My students, again, are doing better jobs of looking at how that um, 
plays out using more qualitative methods, more advanced quantitative, as well as thinking about like why, you know, the why part and integrating um, even within this program of APACE or thinking about how do we amplify that those experiences that we've been doing year to year? We don't want to do research with it. My part largely because there's so much a community development that is I, that I personally find enjoyable. I I, I find I find agency um, and and a sense of especially with all this horrible things going around with racism. I find agency and support and empowered by speaking to my students, by speaking to my community, right? Um, and so, you know, much of what sort of um, Dr. Benellas is doing, we, we wanna see how that sort of, again, translate into these programs or creating new similar programs that from the students' perspectives, what are they benefiting, how they're getting out of it? And I think for me, and I think I, that the benefit of this is, is me being tenured, is that, my engagement with the community is more important than research publications or getting large grant, which I guess is, is sort of the marker for a good scientist, right? Um, I found over the years, those things to be less important than how am I empowered, how am I creating spaces in research, in the community, um, in my classrooms where there were never before, that was not given to me. I find those experiences working with finding sponsors for our students to get t-shirts and get their meals, you know, um, and creating space uh, for them to go back at home for, for driving, gas money, whatever else. Like those things are much more empowering and enjoyable for me um, than trying to implement getting grants or integrating something. And, and I say that with the privilege of having tenure. I say that with the privilege of, of many things, um, but you know, community first and foremost, and then everything else sort of builds around that for me. Wonderful, there were a lot of nuggets there. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we have, we are winding down on time. Um, I would say that if you all have a um, one liner that you would like to leave us with before we get to close out or one nugget that you would like to leave us with before we close out, what would that be for you? One take away. A one liner, can I do like semicolons and dashes and commas? <laughs> one, <laughs> one semicolon. <laughs> You know how we do, you know how we do, like we be right. I, I go back to what I said, you know, like I said, when I was sitting in my mentor's class, right? Kira Hudson Bank's class on psychology of racism and my world was changing, right? Reading Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum's where I the all black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, my world was changing because I was getting language, right? And validation, I was like, I knew, I knew, but I didn't know, right? I would say, and again, this is tough and it's so layered. And if you're at SRCD, let's link up and more conversation to come, but do the work you want to do, right? Like, so I don't have tenure. Do the work you want to do. And, you know, if there are people who are not at your institution or in your location doing the work you want to do, that's community, right? People are doing the work already. You reach out to us. I think I'm speaking, you know, to, to some early career folks, right? Students on the call, folks in the community. People are doing the work. People have come before us. Who's your community? Who are your people? Who can you learn from? The work is happening. Do the work you want to do. My way... My one golden nugget is do not wear a blue shirt when you have a blue background when giving presentations. I just realized that. I'm glad I'm just not a floating head. <laughs> um, I have, you know, again, same. I, I, have a, I have a very hard, I would love to provide a quote that is short, succinct, and 
powerful. Um, and I don't have that. I, you know, what the big thing is, how do you bring your authentic sense of self, not only to the place that you work, but also how do you bring your authentic self to how you engage in the research process? And equally as important is how does that then center the community in which you are studying and participating in? And in doing that, the greatest and find comfort in that uh, the work that we do, no matter how challenging or how isolating, um, there's a community, right? There's a community. There's a community now, and we have ancestors and community before that helped us create a platform for us to be able to do the work that we're doing now. And I think whenever I see going forward, all the challenges that I'm overwhelmed with, I look backward to see who are the shoulders that I am stepping on, right? Who are the ancestors and, 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 and scholars that allow me to be able to do the work that I'm doing now? Because it doesn't, it just doesn't happen without the people before us, right? For the people ahead of us. There's something in there. I'll rewrite that. Thank you so much. So today, I hope that each person who's come to this virtual space will utilize the innovative tools provided by Dr. Banales and Dr. Yu to engage in a transformative research and practice that centers the experiences, expertise, and voices of the very youth who are impacted by oppressive systems. As Toni Morrison once said, if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. Thank you again, Dr. Banyales and Dr. Yu for sharing your wisdom and experiences. We look forward to continuing these conversations at the SRCD Biennial Conference in Salt Lake City. And thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>